Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Cool. A little bit? <laughs> That's because you're not paying attention in the front row. Hi, everyone. I am Rebecca Friedman from FIU. I direct the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. And I'm here tonight. I have the great honor of being here tonight with Mr. Brandon Clark, who is the artist of the incredible show inside the Ward Rooming House Gallery. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Um, so the first thanks always go to Christopher Norwood, the curator, CEO, head honcho of this beautiful place, this historic place. What'd you say? Founder? And the sound man. And the sound man. And probably the founder of the Ward Rooming House Gallery and Hampton Art Lovers. And we've had the pleasure of par partnering with Chris for a couple years now, and it's always a lot of fun. So thanks for being here tonight, and thank you, Chris, for having us. So before we get started, we're just going to have a pretty brief talk right now about the show, and then <clears throat> we're going to have some jazz going. But while the jazz is going, we're going to ask each of you to go inside, check out the show, go upstairs, and just answer a few questions that are related to the themes of the show on film. Thank you very much. And, and, and that basically my team from FIU is here to record your answers to those questions. And that will, Enrique Roselle, thank you Enrique Roselle for being here. Yeah, I gotta thank my team. Thank you everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and also Katie and um, Isabel who are upstairs and my daughter Iris as it happens. Um, so anyway, after this, after, while the jazz is going, if you would go upstairs and answer the questions on film, that helps us get content and, and continue the conversation, okay? So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and read the formal bio of the artist right here sitting next to me. Mr. Brandon Clark is a second generation visual artist who inherited his, his penchant for the craft from his grandmother. Yes. Brandon was introduced to the art world in his grandmother's house where he used to paint with her as a child. His style of painting is distinct from his grandmother's, but her teachings are ever present in his work. Clark's interpretations of art and life resonates through the lenses of abstract expressionism, which you see right away when you go inside and look at the beautiful art. Brandon's art focus, uh, focuses on the power of self-awareness through juxtaposition of form and color on a canvas. He uses words, colors, and compositions on a canvas to make bold statements about the growth of a person and of a culture. Although Brandon mostly works with acrylic, spray paint, and pastels, he also encompasses other mixed media into his work when needed. This helps his viewers see the many visual entry points and feel at liberty to apply their own experiences to the marks on the canvas. And that's what we're gonna ask of you this evening. Brandon believes his art tells stories in which most can relate to through the development of play, playful abstractions that combine creative mark making. Brandon lives in South Dade County with his wife and children. He and his wife are both graduates of Hampton University, which is a word I've heard around here once or twice before. <laughs> um, so the alums of Hampton University, where Brandon earned his bachelor's and master's in architecture. Thanks for being here, sir. That's when you caught. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to say anything before I get going with questions? Um, Thank you guys for being out here. It's a Friday, you know, we could be anywhere else. And uh, I just want to extend my gratitude uh, for you all for coming out and uh, just talking about some cool art. I much appreciate it. Thank you. So maybe I'm going to ask you a broad question to start. If you can tell us a little bit about what inspired this show. Um, so background a little bit more, I, I started believe it or not, during the pandemic. That's when I started to paint. And because uh, some people say, oh, how long have you been doing this? And it's like, oh, well, not that long. Uh, but, you know, my, like I, it was said earlier, my grandmother was a painter. Um, so there, there's something about the inheritance of something, I should say, uh, gifts and talents when I say, oh yeah, you know, you get that from your mom. You know, when your parents are around, your mom or your dad, oh, you know, like that that's your mother. So <laughs> it's, it's that, innate an ability that I had uh, during the pandemic that um, I needed to, it, it just awoke in me. Uh, you know, this is what I did with my time and uh, it became just a full-time passion. So uh, all, all the stuff you see is basically 
<clears throat> what, what I basically tell people is I, I don't paint pretty pictures anymore. Um, I used to do that. Uh, it'd be colorful, vibrant, whatever. It, it'll look great in your home. Look, look great. Uh, but then there became a point in time where uh, painting got really personal and I didn't understand how personal it could get. Uh, and then the painting started to talk to me. Uh, it, was, it was telling me certain things. Like I, I was a little offended by how painting would ask me questions or tell me certain things about myself. It was, it was, it was like, you're not, you're not being real and you're not being authentic. And I was very offended by those questions, but I, but I felt it in my gut. And so I, uh, what you'll see on the walls is this shift that happened when I started to paint. You know, I guess I, I was a lay person, uh, a lay painter, and then I became self-aware. Mm -hmm. And all, all these things basically become, what you see on the walls are emotional notes, basically. Uh, these, are, these are my personal stories. But what so happens is that my story just happens to be relatable to a lot of other people's stories. Yeah. Um, so that's how I, I pull, the, the best thing I could do is pull for myself rather than uh, generate something that I, I haven't touched before. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense, having looked at the, the paint, paintings on the wall. Now, I know the show is called Black Car, but I'm forgetting what's after the colon. Trans, Black Car, Transitions and Cultural Currency. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Black Car, Transitions and Cultural Currency obviously touches a lot on, that's, that's not good, right? Is that working? That's yeah. okay? Okay. Um, touches a lot on themes of the black card and blackness in contemporary society. And I was reading a little bit of before tonight uh, of interviews that you did for newspapers when the show came out. And one of the themes that, that struck me, and I wondered if you could say a little more, is about authenticity. You talk a lot about authenticity and blackness. What does that mean? And who are the gatekeepers of that authenticity when it comes to blackness? So with, with my story, and if you could relate to it at all, um, they say don't judge a book by its cover. However, I do that. Um, and I, I, I look at people and, you know, by, by default, analyze, oh, they look cool. I have my favorite artists. I have my favorite people on screen, movies. And I was like, man, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> um, so for me, uh, when I was doing the painting, I'm, I'm married and I have three children, right? So uh, I can't run away from relationships. Mm -hmm. And the things that relationships do is they call out things. They're basically mirrors, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a choice. I had a choice to either look at it and say that's what's truth and that's what's happening with me. Or I can ignore it and just be like, be in denial. So what, I, what I've done my whole life is basically I didn't know how to be authentic. Um, I, I was surviving, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and surviving was normal. Um, basically, I was, I was looking at life through, I, and I don't know if we're going to the other topics, but basically for me, it was, it was a lot of pain hidden underneath my popularity. I was the person in middle school and high school uh, that I had to fit in because mm -hmm. if I do not fit in, that means you have more of an opportunity to hurt me. Um, and I didn't handle very well rejection. Um, so th there, there's a reason why I behave the way I behave and there's a reason why I act the way I act. Um, it's just not circumstance. So when I'm in relationships, uh, my behaviors affect the people I love. And it's not just hurting me, it's hurting them or it's helping them. Um, so a level of authenticity for me was um, actually, actually saying I just didn't know how. Um, I didn't know how hard that would be um, to say that uh, because it's, I, I don't want to know that I'm bad. I just don't. Um, I, I worked really hard to be a good boy mm. and there's a lot of core beliefs around that. Um, so, you know, I, I faked the funk long enough and it's <laughs> got me to two master's degrees. It's got me a beautiful wife and three children. Um, and, you know, it's, it's gotten me here. But, you know, it's that old adjected, um, you know, gain the whole world, lose your own soul type situation. So uh, I'm only 38. Um, thank God I didn't have to learn that later on in life. 
Um, but but I, I rather learn to love myself mm -hmm. as as lofty as that is. Um, mm -hmm. But but I just never knew how to love myself. Basically, um, I, I did not look in the mirror growing up liking what I saw, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's a lot or at least the conversations that I've had, there's been a lot of people who can relate to that. Mm -hmm. um, so the level of authenticity is basically being okay uh, with all of my brokenness, mm -hmm. uh, being okay uh, and and giving myself approval. I'm not saying I have to like everything, mm -hmm. um, but being, a, being okay with like being irresponsible in some areas, being okay with uh, acting like an eight-year-old in some areas because I just was never dealt with it mm -hmm. and giving myself grace to deal with these things. So all this is like growing up, so to speak. I appreciate that. Thank you. That response, which is very authentic and real. And as someone who's not 38 years old, <laughs> I will say I am just discovering that for myself. And so good for you, <laughs> honestly, <Right. laughs> that you're young to, to ask yourself those questions and, and find those answers. Um, so can I, <clears throat> just given the, the themes of the exhibition, can I push that question a little bit more in the direction of, I guess, race and blackness per se, and how notions of blackness and the black card, as it were, played into your journey? If I can ask it like that. And, and I'm gonna double this question, ask another one, and you can take either or both. Can you explain to the audience, in case they don't know, what the black card is for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I thought it was a, a well-known thing, but I found out some people mm -hmm. didn't know uh, the terminology of a black card or something, or even other cultures uh, have the same uh, construct of something, right? So basically, uh, what I grew up uh, is that if somebody take usually there's somebody taking there's really nobody giving a black card back right so somebody takes your level of blackness so it's basically somebody judging your level of you your culture uh your level of authenticity based off of their standards and then they they approve and they disapprove uh whether or not you're qualified mm -hmm. so the phrase is let me get your black card so for example uh, a song, a slow song comes on, R&B, just slow jamming, like a, a classic, right? Top, top 10, something like that. And you don't know it. You don't know the words. You can't jam to, you, you can like, uh, uh. you know, you can, <laughs> they say if you don't know a song, uh, uh, say watermelon. So if, if you, um, you don't know it and the other person finds out, right? There, there's this, oh, like you, you, you don't know who? Uh, a movie, anything. So sometimes it's based off of what you don't know. Sometimes it's based off of uh, even what you do. Uh, one of the examples is, you know, I, I grew up, I surfed, I skateboarded, I snowboarded, uh, soccer, swimming, sailing, all these things, right? And uh, typically in my, my community, uh, that, that wasn't the norm, so to speak, or that wasn't uh, a common thing, right? Or, or even if you ever heard of the term, uh, you talk white, or you talk like another race, uh, mm -hmm. you don't speak proper English, um, and then they say, uh, that's mine. So mm -hmm. it's, to me, it was, I, I got my, my black card taken a lot. And then there was, uh, there's this thing of, I, I was talking to somebody before, um, actually, and it was, it was like, well, I never, I never gave up my black card. So it's, it's like this, it's not taught in a textbook. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, so why why do we all know it? <laughs> why is it understood? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of the it's it's this physical manifestation of trauma, yeah. basically. And what I've learned in my own life uh, is that I act out my trauma. So what do you do? That that's why it's so it, it can cross so many leaps and bounds. It, it doesn't have to be specifically to one culture or one one's people group um, but I think that's just a testament to all of all of the trauma that's been basically breaking down so so for me it was uh, it, it was this gut so I've learned to chase mm -hmm. gut feelings mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know how to chase uh, they say trust your gut I'm not I wasn't uh, I wasn't very good at that um, I didn't know how to listen to my body um, it was it was you know 
reasoning, something reasoning out, rather than say, trust your gut, you know, to be safe or something like that. So I, I trusted my gut in terms of how I felt uh, on the level of rejection. So mm -hmm. growing up, there was this, um, like I was saying before, I was, I was the token black guy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was in spaces where, where uh, people who looked like me weren't there. And um, you, you feel it, you feel it growing up. Um, you, you feel it in any other culture, you just feel the outcast. Or even if you, I have a whole bunch of friends, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, like I said, I was skateboarding, but I would, back then I was pretty much the only black skateboarder mm -hmm. in my community. Mm -hmm. And um, I love skating, but you just feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do I have to, I don't want to deal with these type of things. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to normalize it. So, so for me, like I was saying, I, I feel like there's an issue uh, in culture uh, that the black card can touch so many areas. Mm -hmm. It's not one specific thing, because even the black card is uh, in a relationship about level of status. Yeah. Uh, how do you have a black card? So our culture, is is still even a, a marketable commodity sure. but you know it's, it's all over the world with music and and all these uh, sports you know mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I don't know if i'm jumping the gun on questions no but you, you keep going it's great so you know so what do we my my, my plight mm -hmm. is that uh i did not want to deal because i'm non-confrontational mm -hmm. i don't like conflict uh i'm an introvert and so art has given me this tool to talk about really hard things. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's given me this safe platform, right? So I never dealt with, until an adult, what it was like growing up black as a adolescent, mm -hmm. um, what it was like growing up as a teenager, and then what was it growing up as an adult? Mm -hmm. And each of those worlds bring their own layer of situations, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was trauma compounding on, on top of trauma on top of trauma. So I believe mm -hmm. that um, something called epigenetics is mm -hmm. that trauma oh, can yeah. get passed down. Uh, so if you ever go to the doctor and the doctor asks you, what are you susceptible? What's your family? Mm -hmm. uh, are you susceptible to diabetes? Uh, what type of cancer do you have, right? Mm -hmm. I believe it's the same thing with emotional and trauma situations. There's certain things that I inherited mm -hmm. uh, that had to, that has been formalized by this, all this. So it goes down from society, mm -hmm. it goes down to the family, and then it goes down to you. Mm -hmm. And then back out, back out. That, that's the scale of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, what you'll see inside is basically the scale of what this little representation of, of, of how I choose to hurt and love myself at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so there's things that deal with the nation. Mm -hmm. What has the nation done? There's things that deal with, uh, you know, if, if a culture, any culture is saying, I'll speak specifically to a black culture, we're saying we want our seat at the table. It's our turn. You need mm -hmm. to recognize us, you need to see us, mm -hmm. it's all these other things, right? Um, we need economical uh, opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, all the gamma. However, if anybody you know is in finance, what, what good is wealth right. if, if you can't maintain it? You know, you, you hear stories of, uh, you know, basketball, people in sports, they lose their money. So how do you, well, what good is it if you can't maintain your wealth? So I'm saying there's basically this level mm -hmm. of, um, if we're asking for something, have we, have we healed enough to maintain what we're actually asking for? In a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. I hope we'll talk more about that with the audience. One of the aspects of this idea of black card that I find particularly interesting, I'm going off script here, so I'm going to just try and respond to what you just said, is <clears throat> in a way you pose that whole concept as a, a kind of like inclusion, if you will, and whether or not you are somehow going to be included in a particular community, right? And if you haven't grown up in that community, you might not be accepted in it for a variety of reasons, cultural markers. What about, like, can it also be exclusionary? To me, that's what's most fascinating about the concept, whether it's, and, and in one of the articles or one of the interviews you talked about, you know, you can have a black card, a Haitian card, a Jewish card, a this card, a that card. You know, I, I, I feel like that's a question mark. Me and, me and my team talked about that a little bit leading up to this evening, so I would like to hear more about that. And, can we allow for that given like the institutional racism and structures of power in our society? Can we just say, well, everyone's got their cards. 
or because of the inclusion and exclusionary nature of the notion of the black card itself, is it in fact particular? Uh, it, it is. Mm -hmm. So with, with anything, it's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, okay, it's okay to own who you are. Sure. So there has to be some uh -huh. level of differentiation. Okay. Uh, so I, like I said, I went to, I was a token black guy. I didn't, my, uh, my wife is the first black person I ever dated. <laughs> you know, go figure. So, but I went to an HBCU, right? And so I've had this experience of these two colliding worlds where when I went to a people group that was, looked like me, the majority, were what I was, there was this level of safety. Mm -hmm. There was this level of acceptance and all this. So, so in terms of, I, I kind of embraced what this level of blackness was. This was my yeah. first time in mm -hmm. college, basically. You know, like mm -hmm. I had to grow up long enough to be like, like I'm actually proud of this. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't grow up in high school beyond like that. Um, because I was saying before, I was in survival mode. So right. this notion of black card mm -hmm. and exclusion, um, it's still mm -hmm. something for me, like like all these, I don't have all the answers to because that's why I have it up there. I'm trying yeah. to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why, you know, this conversation is so important uh, is because, you know, we're, we're talking about how can you not get away from the topics of what are on the news? Um, right. you, you, even, if, even if you want to run from these things, you, they, they should be present and they are present. Um, so for a long time, I've tried to ignore them um, mm -hmm. just because I just couldn't handle conflict very well. Mm -hmm. So now that there's, there needs to be a voice for me, um, it, it, it becomes, to me, it becomes really, really, really tricky because like everything you see is, is such a thin line. Right. Um, uh, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't, you know, you said something wrong, you're out. Uh, you, you don't seem as, uh, you know, even to the point like, uh, do I call you African American? Do right. I call you black? Mm -hmm. You know, like there's, we're, as we're mm -hmm. searching for our own voice and what I should be delineating, there, there's, there's hurt wrapped yeah. up all in it. Right. Um, I, even with mm -hmm. the justice system, it's like, uh, wait a minute, I've been, I'm, like I said, I'm 38 years old. How long have they been creating laws? Would, would there ever be a point where they stop and we get it right? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So, Probably not in our so, lifetime. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's, I think, by default, that's why I'm looking at the self-healing because mm -hmm. I feel like that in, its, in itself kind of would smooth out anything else, mm -hmm. any other uh, label that we have to create. But mm -hmm. there is a sense of ownership I want with the card itself. Mm -hmm. So rather than being like somebody taking it, I'd rather be like, oh, you know, here's, you know, I got a MasterCard, I got a gold card, you know, like, <laughs> like this is mine for myself, mm -hmm. for myself. Thank you. And thank you for all the vulnerability in your answers. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I want to make sure that we give a chance to the audience to ask questions. I have one last one for you because I know we wanted to open it up if anyone has questions. But my last one is, I bet everyone here wants to know what's next for Brandon Clark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, to go home, love my wife and my kids. Um, in the art sense. In the art sense, I know, right? <laughs> um, so, so for me, the, the way, so I have an architectural background, right? So I, I blend the two. Um, so I, I have a whole bunch of notes. Right, and mm -hmm. I there's experiences that I felt with uh, with what's happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, so really, what's for me um, is dealing with trauma, mm -hmm. and trauma in the sense of I think I'm going to continue on the path of what it was like for me growing up, and maybe target specific areas. And mm -hmm. because this the the show you'll see inside is kind of like a breath, uh, an overall brush stroke you'll, you'll see you know paintings of uh, uh, American flags uh, which talks about uh, transactions with with people and within ourselves that's why you'll see credit cards mm -hmm. uh, so it's a literal and metaphorical sense within some of the things the, the top shelf or the top row you're gonna see things dealing quote-unquote that may look pop culture but deals with uh, mm -hmm. products mm -hmm. uh, and what if we kind of reorganize things to fit a, a people group right um, so I think for me um, I'm gonna to try to be working with Chris during our Basel. Um, and, and he's had some more space for me too. So Chris has been amazing and helping me out uh, like a big brother. So for me, it, it's gonna be a lot of, it's gonna get, it's gonna hurt, I would mm -hmm. should say, whatever I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. um, because all this is really painful. 
<laughs> you know, I, I did a painting about my parents' divorce one time, and I remember uh, I showed it during Basel, and it was my first chance to actually grieve uh, yeah. a loss. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I stuffed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember I was doing a, sh doing a show during Basel, and I was talking to somebody about it, and I got more of this the painting started to work more for me because I got more revelation. I started to cry in front of the guy, mm -hmm. you know, so I was like, oh, it was weird. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I'm finding this level of uh, as, as genuine as mm -hmm. I can get. So I'm start. I'm going to be slowing down so I can actually be a little bit more personal. Mm -hmm. I think that rawness is so powerful and speaks, I'm sure, I mean, to me, but I'm sure to all the audiences. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Seriously, I look forward Thanks, to guys. what the next is. So, Chris, should we open it up for questions? A couple yeah. questions? Should we do? I can do it, but I'm just wondering. Do we have yeah. time for questions? Okay. Questions. Nancy. Speak loudly into the mic. Loud, sorry. Okay, loudly. I know how to do that. <laughs> I wanted to go back to what your experience, well, two questions, working, painting with your grandmother was like, and two, can we, is there any place we can see your grandmother's paintings? Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, thank you. Um, so, so for me, uh, with, with my grandmother, um, she she was a self-taught uh, painter. So she did oil, and um, she she what she ended up doing was uh, she lived to be around 100 years old. Um, so she she recently passed, and uh, what what she would end up doing. Uh, I have an older brother, and she wanted to paint. We'll, we'll put it this way. Back in the day, slavery and all that other stuff, um, blacks didn't really know their birthdays. Um, so what they ended up doing is they would write it down in a Bible, right? So there was this lineage of record keeping, right? In, in unconventional ways. So she wanted to leave a journal for my brother and I of her life. So she painted her life and she painted situations that happened to her. Um, so I, she, when she passed away, I inherited her uh, her work, um, and there was a solo show that I uh, I had uh, on Miami Beach where the gallery actually allowed me to have my grandmother's work beside mine. Oh wow! Um, so it, for me, it was like a nice internal, you know, uh, you know, grandma's you know, salute and and, but but it, it taught me about uh, legacy, um, and and it taught me about. Uh, you know, like, like I said, I have kids now. Like, I'm starting. I'm starting to think about what am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna leave my kids? Um, but what it was like painting with my grandma. You uh, painting is like a sensory thing, right? Uh, if, if you really want to get the way I found out to dive into it, um, I'm very tactile like that. So smells. I remember my grandma's. You know, where I painted, just the smell of it. You know, Sorry. and that that brings back more memories than anything. So it's it's the presence of that type. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the situation I have with my grandma. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Brandon, thank you. Uh, could you, since you're not going to bring the microphone into the gallery when we go in there, could you give us a bit of orientation to the sequence of work, what we'll see that is the earliest work in there and how the imagery there leads to the later work and and then perhaps what the connections are and differences between the paintings on the ground floor and the work up and the work upstairs you know in, in particular the um, the the boxes of the uh, the, the, the CDs and uh, no, they're not CDs. Tapes, what are they? Videos, the tapes, right? VHSs. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, what are uh, those? Right. How they connect to the themes you've been talking about here. No. Uh, thank you. Okay. So, quick overview. When you thank go inside, you. Uh, it's kind of broken up into different groups. So, on I would start, however you would like to. But on the wall, you'll see a whole bunch of flags, right? And those were my initial thoughts of of what I was dealing with, right? And that's when I started to take. Uh, Take a look at the scope of impact of transactions, basically, uh, from from a people group uh, to a culture to a nation, and how all all of it's connected. So, 
uh, you'll you'll see uh, the flags. Actually, the ones on the bottom, you'll see that the the paintings are actually done on the back of the canvas. Um, and the reason why I did it on the back of the canvas is because I'm trying to, I'm, I'm basically trying to give significance to things we don't want to show, uh, the things we hide. Um, so you know, when you see the front of a painting, that's it's the most beautiful thing. But really, the crux of who it is, who you are, who I am is within the frameworks of our life. So you'll see that uh, some of them are the frames exposed. So I'm trying to get you guys to ask the question, you know, what happened within the frameworks of your lives? Uh, so kind of keep that in mind as you walk through the gallery. Um, and then uh, you'll see on the back wall, uh, there's two paintings in a uh, case in acrylic and they're, you know, what's it like to be black and what's it like to be heard? So there's, those are like a yin and yang. And that was my first account uh, to give to somebody of my skin color. I was in fourth grade, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you'll see uh, the, uh, the composition of white letters uh, on the back, but a black response on the front. And then if you look on it to the side, it becomes like two paintings. So it's the, hmm. the, the fragility of my response to something that's uh, encrusted in this nation. That's mm -hmm. that's why you'll see the um, the material. So just pay attention to the material and try to look to it at the side. It's it's a, a optical illusion almost. Uh, and then when you switch, you'll see credit cards, and that's kind of dealing with the concept of uh, our currency as a people, uh, music, sports, um, mm -hmm. and and how uh, we we as a, I should say black people have to. There's like two. There's a white version and a black version so the, the black credit card has its status and you'll see white credit cards underneath so it's kind of like uh, this privilege under underneath the mask of mm. what's being presented and then you'll see the white credit card of you know a people asking to be represented as something else um, and then you'll see <laughs> my ID uh, with a little installation uh, I changed all the serial numbers uh, so you can't <laughs> grab it um, but you'll see like you know a physical representation of what you walk around and, and how you have to uh, give up something that's really not even there. Uh, mm -hmm. So you'll see like uh, black cards. And then uh, as you travel up on the stairs, you'll see uh, things, uh, paintings pulled back, uh, materials and context. So that's still the idea of exposure. As you walk up the stairs, you'll see, uh, like you said, the VH tapes. And those are an installation talking about um, that moment that moment when you're challenged uh right before like you're, you're put on the spot for your authenticity to be challenged so i cross mm -hmm. you know i try to cross out the movies so if did you ever see that mm -hmm. and the answer is yes or no so there's a box next door you know ready for you to deposit your authenticity <laughs> uh -huh. um, if you did see it or if you didn't see it if you do know it or if you don't know it mm -hmm. and then on uh you'll see on the top you'll see like kind of a little bit pop culture-ish uh, uh, board games uh, so that's trying to talk about uh, product placement what mm -hmm. happens if uh, uh, companies started to be inclusive specifically towards um, a people group so the game of game of life is really the game of strife uh, uh -huh. operation uh, the game of operation is really assimilation mm. um, and rock'em sock'em robots is talking about uh, interracial fighting uh, and then skateboards are up there, uh, which is kind of something I went through in terms of like belonging uh, mm -hmm. to a specific area. Thank you. Yeah. All right. On that note, I think we're going to invite the audience to go and see the show, but but also and also stay here because we're going to have the Simon Mogul Quartet is going to come up and play some jazz for us now, a couple sets. And when you go inside to see the art, do me a favor and go upstairs and just answer a few questions for us with the Public Humanities Lab. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.